the same tea, you will have a much stronger and thicker body. So you can add milk to it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Camellia. So this is exactly what this lady here is plucking. This is a young tea bush, um, and tea comes from, like you said, uh, Camellia sinensis. Um, and there's two types of Camellia sinensis. You've got Camellia sinensis sinensis, and then you've got Camellia sinensis asamica. And the sinensis sinensis is known as the Chinese variety, and the asamica is known as the Indian variety or the Assam variety. And traditionally speaking, in China, the sinensis sinensis variety is used to make green tea. The leaf is smaller on it. So being a smaller leaf, you're not going to get such a robust and thick and colory cup of tea. Whereas on the Asamika variety, as you can see here, the leaf is much, much larger. So when you harvest this leaf, it's better for making a black tea. If you were to make a green, you can make a green tea with this, but you will have a, a much stronger flavor coming through, which a lot of green teas, well, which a lot of drinkers don't like to have. It, not, not in terms of picking. The only difference between green and black tea is, is the fact that black tea has been left to oxidize. You've, uh, you've, I'll, I'll, I'll get onto this and I'll show you. Green tea, what, what you've effectively done is you've plucked the tea bush, you've then withered it, you've taken the moisture out, you've then rolled the tea, uh, the tea leaf, and then you've immediately put it in, uh, into a dryer to stop the oxidization process. That's why the leaf is still green. Whereas with black tea, you add another process into it. You let, you, after rolling, you let that tea expose in with the air and you change the color of it. To stop that oxidization process, you then fire it. And that's, that's the main difference between green and black tea. But all tea comes from the same tea bush. There's 6,000 different subspecies of tea bush. And the white? White tea, exactly the same thing. Same tea bush, it's, it's a specific variety of tea bush that, that we get white tea from. It all comes from the same bush. People seem to think if you want to make green tea, you've got to use you know, a different bush. You don't need to. You know? All the same tea bush, and it's this. It's Camellia sinensis. So can you pick the leaves off one bush and get three types of tea? Yes, you can, yes. So it's just down to the... the How you manufacture it. Exactly, yes. You know? So you can... You know, pe I mean, there are states that we work with. They have... They have you know, they'll, they'll use one tea bush, and they'll make two or three types of tea from them, you know. Does anyone have a, uh, an idea what those flowers are at the top? You guys are really on point, not like my group yesterday. <laughs> okay, right, let's, right, okay. Uh, <laughs> anyone have an idea what, right, okay, two out of four. Top one? Not Heather. Any idea? What about the one at the bottom? Do you want me to take, tell you guys? Yeah. yeah? Okay, so the top, well, the bottom one here is lemongrass, oh, yeah. right? Now everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah. I knew that. Okay. The top one, I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint. It's from, it's exclusively grown, and this is the only place that, that this product is grown. It's grown in the Western Cape of South Africa. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah, right? So yeah. for marketing purposes, all of these herbs have now been classified as tea. Yeah. But in the strictest scientific sense, None of these are tea. Tea only comes from the Camellia sinensis bush. And these, I would say they're herbal beverages in, yeah. if we're speaking in strict forms. But for marketing, these have all now become teas as well. This is the big fork in the road that I mentioned earlier on. Um, there's two ways that you can make black tea. And this is where Kenya and Sri Lanka, we really, we really differ. So on one side, you've got orthodox tea. And on the other side, you can make tea using the new method, which is known as CTC. Does anyone have any ideas what CTC stands for? 
<laughs> I'll give you a clue. The T isn't for the, the T in the middle isn't for T. Any ideas? Technology. Uh, close. We'll, we'll talk about technology actually on T fields on the next slide. Cryogenic. No, not cryogenic. <laughs> Shall I tell you? Yeah. Okay. Very simple words: crush, tear, and curl. Uh. Nothing scientific at all. Just you know, and and this is exactly the process. So you take a tea leaf. You crush it, you tear it, and then you curl it, which sounds nice, but when you're making tea, you want, to, you want to taste aroma. You want to taste flavor. You want to be able to taste where your tea has come from, as you can do with wine, as you can do with whiskey. And through the CTC method that's been pioneered since, you know, the, since the 60s, you don't get any of those. And most importantly, you don't need to have any skills and you don't need to have any expertise to make CTC tea. Do you buy tea in the supermarket? Mm. That's why. And this, is, and this is where we come into the fork in the road. The old way, which is what we still do in Sri Lanka and what, what is mainly done for the export market in India, is we make it in the traditional way so that you can taste the aroma, you can taste the flavor, and you can certainly look and, and, and then be able to taste uh, the terroir and the flavor in the tea. But to do this, you need a lot of skills and you need a lot of expertise. So what kind of teas do you guys drink at home? Do you guys drink... What are the brands you guys drink? Tetley. Tetley? Okay. I don't drink tea. Don't drink tea? <laughs> <laughs> I think I drink a Scottish one. Mm -hmm. It's Scottish decaffeinated. And I just have I like it on pet days because I like the flavour. Okay. So I, 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 I drink but green tea. Okay. Drink, so. Right. So if you take the largest tea brands in the world, if you say Tetley's, I mean the largest tea brand in the world is, is Lipton's, yeah. right? So Mr. Lipton, who is a Glaswegian, mm -hmm. Twining's, family business, Mr. Twining, Tetley's, family business about 50, 60 years ago, Brook Bonds, family business, even PG, family business. These were all bought up by large multinationals. Mm -hmm. By the 50s, 60s, when my grandfather was running this company, 90% of Lipton's teas were all from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. They pretty much bought up everything Sri Lanka produced, Lipton bought. Today, less than 5% of Lipton uses sh Sri Lankan tea because after they were bought up by a multinational, multinationals stopped looking at the aroma, the flavor, and the taste, and they started looking at profit. So what they did was they took planters from Sri Lanka, they took them to Kenya, opened up vast areas of land, they found types of sp subspecies of bushes that you know, give you a lot of tea. They're very high yielding. However, they're not what we would call a quality cultivar. When you make tea with them, you don't get robust you know, tastes and flavors out of these bushes. But they produce a lot, you know? They produce a lot of green leaf. And then they pioneered this method known as CTC. And they slowly changed the flavor and taste profile of what the consumer wants. Because the consumer has never ever said, we want to have cheap tea that's convenient that we can just have. The consumer never said that. It's large business that has slowly changed the consumer's taste. But today, Thanks to the internet, and I think you know, by people like yourselves coming out to things like this, you know, the consumers are starting to really ask, look, where is our tea coming from? Why can I not taste anything? Why am I lacing it with milk and sugar, you know, and just putting a tea bag in and dunking it and pulling it out? Why am I not getting you know, the true taste and flavor of a cup of tea? I mean, one, one problem I find is that I particularly do not like fair play tea. Mm -hmm. It's such a sort of I'm sure it's not. But you can't tell what you're going to get. Exactly. It's the, 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 the biggest problem that you have with these tea companies, all of these companies, they started off as family businesses. They became so big because they looked at what the consumer wanted. But today in the industry, what you have is you have a purchasing manager who sets a price for how much his tea blend will, will come to. So if you've had a drought that's been affecting, let's say, Kenya, and the world tea price of black tea goes up in price, they don't then look for a tea that that's going to cost a bit more so that the consumer gets a better deal. They just look for a, you know, they look for another tea that's, that's being produced at a cheaper price mm -hmm. where you're not getting the same expertise or the skills and sometimes even the same hygienic conditions that are being, that are being implemented. Mm -hmm. So this is the fork in the road, but this is what we produce in Sri Lanka. We produce orthodox tea. This is what I want to talk to you guys about on, on how we make tea. So this is a 
an image of a tea plantation up in the Dimulla region. It's, you're at about five and a half thousand feet there. It's a beautiful, beautiful area of the, of, of the country. And this is, what, this is how we make great tea. Great tea starts off in the tea field. It doesn't matter how good your skills are as a tea manufacturer if you don't have a good green leaf to begin with. You've got to have good husbandry practices on, on, a, t on a tea plantation. And this is what we use to make good tea. So if you want to make a good cup of tea, and there's a saying, it says you can use good leaf to make good tea, you can take good leaf and make bad tea, but you will never take bad leaf and make good tea. And what I mean by good leaf is what this lady here, and her name is Saroja Muniandi, she actually used to look after me as a child, and I was a bit of a terror to her. <laughs> but uh, this is what she has in her hand. She has, uh, she has two leaves and a bud. And this is the most tender point of a tea bush that you want to pluck and that, and that you want to use to, to make tea. Any, can you guys see down here? What she's holding is quite light, and up here it's much darker in color. The reason that it's darker is that's the mature um, leaves of a tea bush. And what, the reason why we want the tenderest points of a tea bush is because when we wither it, we want to be able to impart a twist on that leaf because it's young. The leaf, is able, well, the leaf is able to bend and you're able to slowly crush out um, the flavor that, that's locked inside. With the mature leaves, and this is what I meant by bad leaf, it's plucking mature leaf like that. When you pluck mature leaf and you try and impart that same twist, you snap the leaf. So you're not extracting the flavor that's, that's left inside the leaf. And this is why you've got to pluck um, two leaves in a bud. Do you know what kind of technology is used on a tea plantation today? to pluck this kind of tea. Exactly, no Google Glasses, no Apple iWatch, there's no apps on tea estates where people walk around and go, yep, that one's good to pick, pick that. There's none of that. There's the, hu there's the human Mark One eyeball and the human Mark One hand, and ladies like this who are able to pick tea, who are able to select which, which leaf to be picked, which one to be left till next week, and they will pick over a tea bush at an alarming rate. Absolutely, yes. It's a 12-month growing cycle. So a tea bush, you need to pluck a tea bush every seven days. Um, every seven days, you'll have new shoots that would have matured, and you've got to pluck those. At the same time, while you're plucking, you're then also trimming the tea bush as well. So if you let a tea bush grow, a tea bush can grow up to 10 meters in height. Um, but, but, you know, while they're plucking, and, and they'll, I don't know if you've seen the pictures, but you'll always find tea pluckers with a stick. And the reason why they have a stick is they'll put a stick on top of the tea bush. Anything above the stick, is what they used to pluck. Any That's why it's, it all looks as if it's been cut by a machine because it's all exactly the same height, but it's been sort of grazed by hand. Exactly, yes. So in CTC manufacture, this is what you don't get. You don't get hand plucking. Mm -hmm. You get, because, I mean, our, our tea plantations, you saw, are, you know, put on very, you know, on, on, uh, on, on gradient slopes. Whereas in Kenya, they've got flat tea plantations you can get a combine harvester that can just cut everything on top and scoop the leaf up. But at the same time, you end up with mature leaf coming in and you get stalk coming in, which is not good for making tea. So this is where it all begins. So you start plucking tea early in the morning and you have your tea that's then sent to a tea factory and we'll taste the tea that's actually made in this very factory today. This is uh, known as Pedro Tea Factory. The tea is sold under the name of Lover's Leap and the reason why it's called Lover's Leap is because there's a, there's a waterfall on this tea plantation. And the story goes, I don't know if it's true, but I'll tell you guys anyway. Um, the story goes that there was, a, there was a Sri Lankan prince who fell in love with a fair maiden. And they eloped to the area of Norelia. They were pursued by the king's men, and when they realized they couldn't be together, they jumped off the waterfall. So that waterfall is now known as Lover's Leap. The division is known as Lover's Leap. And this particular tea estate sells its tea uh, as Lover's Leap tea. And in fact, this tea is one of the favorites of the Queen. She enjoyed a, a, tea, here, uh, a tea from here for her Diamond Jubilee. And I'll, and I'll serve that up to you guys at the end. So the first stage in making a good cup of tea is withering. Anyone have any idea what withering is? 